morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of the Lord. It's really good to see you on this fourth Sunday of Easter. If anybody's a liturgy kind of geek, I will say, you know what Sunday it is? Wow, we have a lot of liturgy gurus, <laughs> let's call them that, in the congregation, in the house. Yes, the fourth Sunday after Easter is always good. Well, not always, but in our liturgy we follow. It's Good Shepherd Sunday. And I was just saying to Shara, I forgot to bring in our stuffed animal sheep and goats and all those little guys. So we'll have to see. Maybe Shara can run and go find one of the sheep a little bit later. He's lost. But Jesus, that's a whole other parable. <laughs> Maybe this is meant to be. Yeah, that's, that's a little different. But it is Good Shepherd Sunday. And it's a little confusing, I have to say, because in the gospel that we're going to hear in a little bit, Jesus says he's a shepherd. And then people didn't get it. And then he said, well, there's a guard, too, who lets the sheep into the gate. He goes, oh, and by the way, I'm the gate. And I always think, Jesus, what are you? <laughs> what are you? So we'll hear why he's telling the religious leaders in his day and us today how and why he's the shepherd and also a gate. What does that mean for us today? I think it means a lot, actually. In our worship, um, and especially after worship, you'll see Pastor Julie Boleyn from the Kaleidoscope Institute. She was here to help lead us in a session of training for our wellness conversations back a few months ago. And the council, anybody who was trained, um, you can take part in the debriefing from noon until 1.30, but I just wanna share before that, everyone, and I mean everyone, is welcome to a lunch that some of you have provided here. And I know Danette, you did, and Alita, Carolyn, did anybody else bring food? Carolyn, um, the recipe for the Sloppy Joe's yes. members 4-H recipe. Oh, it's a 4-H? So it's, it's going to be good. And we made plenty for... Excellent. So don't rush off. You need to stay. Even our youngest one here, little Jackson, you guys and your family, everyone, you are welcome to stay for lunch following worship. It's a great day. I love it when lunch is included. Well, I've been talking too much already. So we're going to stand in worship. I invite you to stand as you're able in your worship bulletin, should you need one there on the back table. I think we're running a little low. I know you're good sharers, too. But we start on page two with the call to worship, which is based on the holy currency doxology and faithful innovation guiding principles for mission. Praise God! The good shepherd calls us by name and gathers us in. Blessings of abundant life flow. Abundant life. The Holy Spirit is active in the world today, circling throughout the earth so all may grow. There's no need to fear, little flock. We may give freely and are renewed by joining in God's work, God's grace. This is so important. God's grace reaches far and wide. Alleluia. All are welcome and receive abundant life. Amen. We sing in the red hymnal, number 502, The King of Love My Shepherd Is. Tadashi and family, Mitch and Melissa, were here for Sunday school but had to rush off to a family obligation. So in Sunday school, we were talking about baptism. And Tadashi's only three, right? So it's hard to understand I mean, even for adults, what baptism really entails. So we were splashing in some water and had some little shells, those, like those tiny little tiny shells that are kind of curled up where hermit crabs live. And we were listening for God's voice. First, I thought we were listening for the crab to make sure he wasn't home living in there. But Tadashi said, I hear God's voice. And I just want to share that with you today because when we pour these waters whether we remember who lives in a shell or not, or what's in our home, or who's in our home, or wherever the water is being poured, if it's Lake Michigan, or as Tadashi said, swimming at the beach with his excavator, 
in Florida, I'm assuming either the Gulf course or the Atlantic Ocean, um, he just got us everywhere. These are our storied waters, and we were splashing with that little shell, praying for all of God's creatures, and then marking the sign of the cross on our foreheads and reminding each other that Jesus loves us. So later on today, when you come up for communion or for the blessing, dip your finger in these waters and splash and remember, just as God loved that little crab that lived in that shell, how much more we are treasured. So we splash in these waters and we continue with the thanksgiving for baptism. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the people. God's word does not return empty. God's word accomplishes that which God intends. Humanity recircling God's abundant gifts and resources so that every person in all creation is enlivened through the outpouring of love manifest in Jesus Christ. Come to the waters of baptism where life flows in God's grace through faith. Amen. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. We pray together, the top of page four. Redeeming God, Free us from the ways of this world that rob us of life. Teach us to use this time and place as a sanctuary of welcome for all. Lead us into respectful relationships and gracious leadership. The honored truth and creates wellness for the sake of Jesus, our good and genuine shepherd. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And what are we about to read? It was the day of Pentecost. Many people were gathered together in one place. Of nowhere and everywhere, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the people. They became a new community, sustained by worship, holy communion, and fellowship. They shared their belongings with each other generously so that everyone had enough. This is the foundation of being church together in every time and place. And so the reading begins. All who were baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possession, possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I invite you to stand on page four. We sing the gospel acclamation together. Some context for what we're about to hear. The religious leaders of Jesus' day confront Jesus for having healed a man who was born blind. They believed his blindness was the result of his, or most likely, his parents' sin. The leaders question how Jesus was able to redeem this man once blind from sin. 
Jesus corrected them. The man's blindness was not the result of sin. And since they, the leaders, couldn't see God's redemptive restoration in the man who had been born blind, who now sees, their sin, the religious leaders, their sin remained. So in this next portion that we're about to hear of this event that continues, Jesus further explains his mission using the analogy, the example of the shepherd and the gate. Jesus came to restore people to God, thereby giving abundant life to all who see and believe, like the blind man who was healed. The Gospel according to John chapter 10. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the religious leaders, I assure you that whoever doesn't enter into the sheep pen through the gate, but climbs over the wall, is a thief and an outlaw. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but will run away because they don't know the stranger's voice. Now, those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. So Jesus spoke again. I assure you, he said, that I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves or outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in, and they will go out, and they will find pasture. The thief enters only to steal or kill or destroy. But I came so that they could have life indeed, so that they could have life to the fullest. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, the shepherd, the guard, the gate, all of these. Jesus uses the analogy of the shepherd and the gate to clarify again his intention, which was to invite everyone into an abundant life, not according to the world, but an abundant life, life to the fullest, with God, especially Especially, now remember, he just healed the blind man. Especially those people who have been cast out by society, picked on, attacked by many people, community, even religious leaders, like the blind man was. Is it still happening today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just in the news this past week and the week before, Instead of the blind in Jesus' day, I think of the trans community, especially the trans community and the LGBT community, which is being ostracized or attempted again through oppress oppressive legislation and hate crimes that still go on and on and on. And complicit are congregations and synods and denominations who remain silent. It was angered not too long ago when I heard one of my colleagues in the ELCA in our synod say, well, you got to love the sinner, but hate the sin. I don't think that's exactly what Jesus was saying here, not at all. And this attitude to love the sinner and hate the sin is still backed up by exclusive actions of who belongs and who doesn't, who's in the sheep pen and who isn't. Who is not welcome? Because it was no different in Jesus' time with his religious authorities, many of them, not all, but many. And that's exactly why Jesus used and healed the blind man to make a point. Jesus loved the blind man and knew him by name. He knew him by name and loved him when others wouldn't who made that deliberate choice 
no, I won't. And therefore, this division, this divide grew and continues to grow, I would say, between Jesus and humanity. Because the blind man, much like every person on earth, whether we understand them or not, their identity, their expression or not, is absolutely worthy of God's love and our love. And is absolutely worthy and receives regardless of anybody else's thought in humanity, receives life to the fullest in Jesus Christ. That's why these waters are so important. That man didn't follow the voice of the other religious leaders in his time. Well, I guess he couldn't because he wasn't allowed into the temple. But he certainly knew the voice of God, which was a voice of love. And Jesus, like the gate moving out from the shepherd right now, brought the man back into the fold, back into the sheep pen, restored him to his community where they said no. But Jesus said yes. The community where he lived fully. Jesus, the gate, brings all who are lost, all who have been intentionally exiled, into the fold, which sounds an awful lot to me like a sanctuary, like a place of worship, where we, with all of our differences, we say we leave them at the door and we lead them die at the door, where we become the community living in Christ to the fullest together with a beautiful diversity of all of our individual selves and lives and expressions all of our generations together. That is the church community. That is the beautiful, diverse community, the place where we, the church, get to live in Christ to the fullest. Practicing, and I say practicing because we don't always get it right. Practicing genuine welcome. Where we often begin at the font, where all of our sinful lives die and drown with Christ and rise again, washed new. Amen? Amen. Amen. Where we practice inviting graciously for all to come and see the good news of Jesus Christ through ministries of wellness that happen here and with our partner ministries. This past Tuesday, several of us went to Hephatha Lutheran and we had a fun pizza party. I think we ordered like 20 pizzas and delicious brownies and goodies, and we sat with children that we didn't know, and I have never laughed so much in my life. Where Pastor Mary Martha had their Tuesday praise, where every child was told, Jesus loves you, especially in a community where they have so many struggles, where they have so many struggles. God doesn't care. And the church shouldn't either. We get to love radically just as Jesus loves radically. Ongoing love, practicing, wellness, advocating for justice, and lead-free pipes and laterals, listening to our children's questions and stories, like little Tadashi being so concerned about that little crab. I just picked up a shell and brought it home and thought, oh, I didn't know that Tadashi be worried that that crab maybe didn't find another home. <laughs> children tell us beautiful things that we might think about, wonder about, notice, and have curiosities to say, how do we take that question and what do we learn from, from that? What about fair and equitable housing? Hmm. Advocating for justice. Listening to our children's stories. Tending to the needs of the sick, the aging. Joining in God's work, the Holy Spirit that's already at work outside in the neighborhood and world. I mean, thanks be to God. Can you imagine if it was just up to us? We get to join in God's ongoing work already happening. It doesn't have to take 18 different committees and submit this to the council. And No, we do it every time we walk into this place and are fed and walk back out. Life to the fullest with Jesus. 
Life to the fullest with Jesus is quite different, isn't it, than life to the fullest according to the world and the world's expectations on all of us. Measuring up. I still struggle with that one. Having financial security independence. Being successful. Trusting yourself above all others. I mean, what does that say when we say, I can trust myself and I can go it alone? When we think about one of God's greatest commandments, to love our neighbors, what does that say when we put all of our trust in ourselves? Seems an awful lot like we're looking at a mirror right back to us and being very happy with our lives. Meanwhile, what about our neighbors? How are we loving them? And how are they informing our lives? The world and life to the fullest according to the world is quite different. A young African-American young man remarked that he wouldn't amount to much because that's what the world tells him. And another African-American young girl just said her prayer, and she's about 12 years old at the time, her prayer was that she wouldn't be shot before she was 18. The world and life to the fullest and Jesus' life to the fullest and the churches in between we are the church and that life that we get to share with others. This is the church mission. Jesus the shepherd, Jesus the gate, calling us, leading us. It can be confusing, even in verse 6 of this chapter 10 in John's gospel. The religious authorities and all the people, even his disciples who were there, said, wait, I'm confused by all of this. And God can be confusing. I mean, I'm a pastor. I've had theological trainings. I know some of you have too. Does anyone have God figured out? Okay, because maybe I went to the wrong seminary. <laughs> maybe I should have gone to LSTC. This past week, I just want to leave us with this. This past week, I heard a man on a podcast talking about his understanding of God and how most of his life he was not a Christian, he didn't go to church, but he heard the Lord's voice in probably what seemed to be his darkest hour. I don't know this man's name. I simply heard this. And he explained not his understanding of God, but his misunderstanding of God using this example. And I think this is brilliant. He could teach at a seminary. He was inside of his house, and he thought he was the only one who was home alone. He had a family, a wife, kids, dog. He thought, quiet, no one's home. And suddenly, scared half to death, his wife from behind him called out his name, and he jumped. She had been in the house the whole time. His misunderstanding of God was that God was not in his house the whole time. He said, my God, I've been missing this. God has been in my house, in my life the whole time, and I didn't know it, just like my wife. God is with us. That shepherd's voice. We know the false shepherds, but we certainly know the good shepherd when he calls our voice, he calls our name with his beautiful voice, a voice of love and grace, a voice that rises above all others, a voice that will not dispel the difficulties, the fears, the hardships of this world, but will lead us through. And to that I say amen. Thanks be to God. And thanks be to God, especially when we're caught surprised, like, oh, God, my good shepherd, the gate, you've been here the whole time. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, sing to us the joy of Jesus' resurrection, from whom all blessings flow, circling the earth so all people might grow. Vanquish our fears so all may give generously and with gratitude, and widen your grace through our faith so all might have abundant life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys belong to you. Where there is destruction, bring healing. Where there is desolation, 
bring abundance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, direct leaders to learn from your instruction. Give them servant hearts that they generously seek the good of all. Abolish the plans of leaders who impose cruel and dangerous legislation on the LGBTQ and especially trans population. Help us remember that every person is created in your image. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, you walk ahead of us always. We pray for those feeling overwhelmed by anxiety, depression, or suffering in any way. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, you are the gate that gives safety to your flocks. Protect refugees, victims of domestic violence, black and brown people oppressed by white supremacy, and all people who are vulnerable. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord, our good and genuine shepherd, you call us by name and lead all through the valley of death. We give you thanks for those who have died and now dwell with you forever. Be with those who mourn and give them hope in the promise of resurrection. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For what else does this worshiping community pray for today? Your mercy is great. Lord, we pray for Sudan and the harm that comes to all people as brother fights against brother. Protect them, guide them, and bring some measure of peace. Shepherd them. God, in your mercy. Your mercy is great. Into your arms, gracious Lord, we pray for all who we have named, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our shepherd, and the good gate who leads us in and out of this place. Amen. The peace of the Lord is with you. Let's share in that peace together. God's peace. <laughs>